All right, good evening. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came. Guilty sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood. Amen. Sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Amen. I love that song. I was just telling my buddy Dave about that song and then they played it. And it, it was, uh, I love that song. You know, I, I think about Christ there, how they, how the Romans scourged him. They scourged him. They tied him to the post and, and whipped him. And the Bible says, Christ said in Psalm 22, He said, I may tell all my bones they stare upon me. As he hung on the cross, he could look down and see his bones staring back at him. The Romans ripped the flesh right off of him. And that Bible said he was wounded for our transgressions. Amen. Amen. I think about that and I think as they sat there and whipped him, it was, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou mayest not eat. Pow! Amen. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Boom! Thou shalt not make unto thyself any graven image. Wow! He was being striped and wounded for us. Amen. For all of man's transgressions, all of man's Amen. disobedience. Right. And it makes me want to say, Hallelujah! Amen. What a Savior! Amen. Amen. First Timothy chapter 2 again is where we're going to start. God wants all men to be saved and to come to what? There you go. So y'all remember from this morning, right? Now we talked about salvation. We talked about how God saves men. Amen? God wants all men to be saved. You know what that means? John Calvin was a liar. Amen? God wants all men to be saved. He died for all. Amen? And He wants all men to be saved. And all who call upon Him can be saved and will be saved. But we're going to begin this second part now here about this coming to the knowledge of the truth. God doesn't just want all men to be saved. He wants all men to come to the knowledge of the truth. Yes. Amen? Now there's only one authority of truth. Yes. Romans chapter 3 verse number 4 says, Let God be true and every man a liar. Amen. That's the Pope. Amen. That's preachers. The only thing in this world that will not lie to you is God. The only truth in this world is God's Word. As the Bible said in Psalm 119 and verse 6, 160, Thy Word is true from the beginning. From Genesis 1-1 clear to Revelation chapter 22, this book is true from cover to cover. Every jot, every tittle, every comma, every every period, semicolon, every word of God, as Proverbs said, is pure. Every word of God is pure. The Bible said, Add thou not to his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Any man that adds to the word of God is a liar. Amen. But God's Word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endure forever. So if we're going to come to the knowledge of the truth, there's only one truth in this world, and it's the Bible. The King James Bible. Jesus Christ shed His blood to give you this book. Amen? The Son of God died on a cross to give you every word in that book. Every promise God made from Genesis onward, when He made promise to Abraham, when He made promises to David, God was making every one of those promises on the faith that His Son was going to come and die on the cross one day. The only man and the only being that God ever trusted in heaven and earth was the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Not only is God's Word true, Jesus Christ is true. Now He says right here, Sanctify them through thy truth. This is Christ talking. Thy word is truth. Do you know what sanctifies you? The word sanctified means to be set apart for God. 
And what sets you apart in this world, what sets you apart in this world from everybody else in the world is this book. If that book is in you, this book sets you apart. It sanctifies you for God. It makes you holy for God. Amen. But look at what he says here. David said, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. Do you know where God wants His Word and His truth? He wants it inside of you. He wants it in, he wants it in your inward parts. God wants His desire is for this book to be inside of you. All right. As Paul as Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, he said, We are not ministers of paper, paper and ink right. written on stone. He said, But we are ministers of the Spirit yeah. written upon fleshly tables of the heart Amen. with the Spirit of the living God. God wants this book written on the heart of every man in the world. He desires this truth in our inward parts and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. If you let that book inside of you and you put the Word of God inside of you, God through that truth is going to make you to know wisdom. Amen. 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 You know what Solomon said about wisdom? He said it is the principal thing. That means it is the most important thing. Wisdom is the most principal, the highest thing. And the Bible, he goes on to say, he says, Therefore, get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. Amen. And so we're going somewhere with all this. But look at what Paul said in Colossians now. He said, why is it so important for us to know the truth? Because you don't know how to walk pleasing to God without knowing the truth. Amen. You know, one time God told, told a man, I'm going to flood the earth. And then He told that man, if you want to be saved, build an ark. Right? Well, guess what? There's not a flood coming today, so it would be a waste of your time to build an ark. God doesn't want any of you to build an ark. Right? And so as time goes on, God changes or His Word progressively reveals more and more truth. God is not doing today. He's not doing today what He was doing 4,000 years ago or 5,000 years ago. And so if you want to walk in the will of God, you have to understand what God is doing right now today in the world. Amen. As Paul says right here, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will. Amen. God wants all men to know the truth. And He wants all men to have a knowledge of His will. The will of God is not out there in the world, guys. And you've got to go look for it. The will of God is right here in His Word. Amen. If you will read His Word, you will be filled with the knowledge of His will. And all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Watch this. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. The only way you and I can go out here and walk daily worthy and pleasing unto God the Father. The only way I can walk pleasing of God is I first have to know His will with all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And then I'll be able to make good decisions and walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing being fruitful in every good work. So it's not... God doesn't just want you to be saved. He wants you to come to this knowledge of the truth. It's important. It's very important. Right? Now, that being said, there's plenty of warnings in the Bible about men who corrupt this book. Amen? Paul, told, Paul warned us about ministers of Satan who transform themselves into the ministers of righteousness. He talks about men. He says, we are not as many. Look up here. Jeremiah 23, 36. God says, for ye have perverted the words of the living God. God gave Israel, the nation of Israel, He gave them His Word. And you know what Israel did with that Word? They perverted it. They corrupted the words of the living God. Matthew 22, Christ said, you do err. Not knowing the Scriptures. There are many in this world that go to church that do not know the Scriptures. Amen? Amen. Amen. In America, you, you can... There, 
Everybody goes to church in America, but most people in America couldn't quote five verses out of the Bible. They go to church every Sunday, but they couldn't quote five verses out of the Bible, and they err because they do not know the Scriptures. Amen. Most people professing Christianity in the world do not know the Scriptures. And because of this, they make major errors with the Word of God. There are many men who pervert the words of the living God, and there are many men who err not knowing the Scriptures. In 2 Corinthians 2, Paul said, For we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. Paul said there are many that corrupt the Word of God. You know what that means? You better not trust every man walking around with the Bible. Amen? Because there are many men who corrupt the Word of God. Amen? 2 Peter 3, Peter says, Which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other Scriptures under their own destruction. So you know what that means? God gave us His Word, but God expects us to handle this Word with great care. He intends for us to be careful with it. He intends for us to study it. He intends for us to believe it, to obey it, and to commit it and teach it to other men. Amen? Because there are many in this world, if you don't do that, and you don't take great care with the Word of God, you're going to become one of the many that pervert it, corrupt it, and rest it to their own destruction. Amen? It is a fearful thing, guys. It is a fearful thing to stand and handle the words of a holy God. Amen? It is a fearful thing. And I, I take it serious. I take it very serious. Amen? Now, when we talk about the truth, right here is the word of truth. God wants you to come to the knowledge of the truth. But there are many who take this book, as we've seen, they pervert it, they corrupt it, they twist it. And now Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15 that if you want to be a workman, if you want to labor with God and be a workman with God, there's something God requires. There's a requirement for you to be a workman in the Word of God. And Paul says that the requirement is is that you must rightly divide the Word of Truth. That is a skill that God requires in His workmen. Look at what Paul said. Study to show thyself approved unto God. That's personal. You, if you want to be a workman, you have to study personally to show yourself approved to God. And through studying, God will... But what actually approves me? What actually approves me is rightly dividing the Word of Truth, but I can only rightly divide the Word of Truth if I study the Word of God. Amen? Amen? Amen. In, in America, we, we send men to Bible school, you know. We send them to these big Bible universities and these big seminaries. And most of them come back and don't even believe the Bible anymore. Amen? Amen. Those seminaries are not making workmen. They're making infidels. They're making unbelievers in the Word of God. God gave us His book. He gave us the truth. And He said, study it. Amen. Study it to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. So that you're not one of the many that corrupt it and pervert it and err and don't know the Scriptures. God wants us to study it so that we can show ourselves approved unto Him as men who know how to rightly divide the Word of Truth. Amen? So what do you got to do? You got to study. So I want to look at what does that mean to study? What does that mean to study? Well, we're going to focus on that for just a moment. Look at what Paul tells Timothy here in 1 Timothy chapter 4. I already heard the brother, I think it was him that mentioned being attentive. Did you right. talk about being attentive, right? Paul said, till I come, give attendance. 
That's what you're doing tonight. You're attending. You know, even Jesus Christ, when He walked this earth at 12 years old, they went and found Him and He was in the temple. And they said, they, uh, His mother said, He said, me and your father was looking for you. He said, which was you looking for me? Did you not know I must be about my father's business? And you know what He was doing? He was in the temple hearing and asking questions. He was given attendance so that He could learn the will of God from the Word of God. And so when we talk about study, Paul says, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. You need to, be, you need to give attendance to reading this book, to letting that book exhort you, to letting that book teach you. Find men that are teaching the Word of God correctly. Amen. That are giving you good doctrine, as, as Solomon said back there. He said, "He said, children, hear the instruction of a father, for I give you good doctrine." Amen. Amen. I believe this brother right here gives you good doctrine. Amen. Amen. And so you are to give attendance to reading, the exhortation, the doctrine. Now look what he says: meditation. Not just read it, but as you're, you know, when I'll be driving my my car back home sometimes and I'll just start Romans and I'll just start quoting Romans in my head and thinking about these things meditating upon these things Paul said let the word of Christ dwell in you richly God wants that book in you richly he wants it he wants it in your in your mind and in your heart amen he wants us to meditate upon these things now look at what he says Give thyself wholly to them. Not one foot in and one foot out. He wants you completely, wholly dedicated unto these things. Right? Read, exhort, doctrine, meditate. Give thyself wholly to them. That thy profiting may appear to all. Now look what he says. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Now what's he talking about being saved there? Well, look back in 1 Timothy 4.1. Look, look at 1 Timothy 4.1. I want to show you the salvation he's talking about. He's not talking about being saved from hell here. Timothy's already saved. He's already justified. So he's talking about a different kind of salvation. What kind of salvation is he talking about? Well, look in 1 Timothy 4, 1 at the warning. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Paul's telling Timothy, Timothy, there's going to come a time when men are going to depart from this. And they're going to start listening to doctrines of devils and seducing spirits. He says, but you... You give attendance to reading. You give attendance to exhortation. You give attendance to doctrine. Amen. Meditate. Give yourself holy to it. Continue in it. For if you do this, you will both save yourself and them that hear thee. Save himself from what? The departure and the apostasy that's going to take place in this world. Many are going to depart from the faith. Many are going to give heed. But you don't have to be one of them. If you will read and give your attendance to exhortation and to doctrine and to meditation upon the Word of God, you will save yourself from that deception. Amen? Amen. Amen. Guys, religion is one of the most dangerous things in this world. When we talk about study, we're not talking about just reading five verses and going about your day, going to church once a week. We are talking about reading the Word of God Giving yourself wholly to it every day. Amen. In Proverbs, look at what he says here. He says, Incline thine ear unto wisdom, and apply thine heart to understand it. So not only are you to give your ear to wisdom, but once you receive that wisdom, you have to apply the heart to understand it. Amen. Amen. Then he says, Yea, if thou criest after knowledge. You've got to want it. You've got to cry for it. 
Father, teach me. Give me your truth. Show me your knowledge. You've got to want it. God resisteth the proud, but He giveth grace to the humble. Amen? You've got to want it. He says, Yea, and liftest up thy voice for understanding. If thou seekest her as silver. Amen? And searchest for her as for hid treasures. Yes, sir. Right there, unsearchable riches. You know where all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hid? They're hid in the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. And if you want to know these hid treasures and these unsearchable riches, you have to want them. And if you will do this, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. And so the first, the first step in studying... Is your inner man, your your heart has to be right. You have to want these things. Your motives have to be right. Right? You, it's not about trying to appease a religion or a denomination. It's about approving ourselves unto God through studying the Word of God. Amen? So how do we study? Well, my, my friend out here hit on it already today. He preached, he preached half my message today. Amen. But look at what he says here in Isaiah 28. We're going to get into this right division here in just a moment. But I'm setting this up. Look at this question. Whom shall he teach knowledge? That's a question. And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Do you want God to teach you knowledge? Amen, I do. Do you want God to make you understand doctrine? Amen. I do. Yeah. Well, who does, he, who does He teach knowledge and who does He make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. Amen? Yeah. Now, look at what He says. For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept. Line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. God doesn't want you going around quoting three verses to back up what you believe. That's what, that's what most people do. They go around, they have four verses that they quote the rest of their life. God wants you studying this book. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. God wants you to study every word. He wants you to meditate, study it, look at it, build, line upon line, precept upon precept. Not just one or two verses, three or four verses. God wants you studying. Man lives by what, brother? Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. God wants you studying the Word of God line upon line. Precept upon precept. And when you do that, God will teach you knowledge and He will make you to understand doctrine. How does He do it? By comparing spiritual things with spiritual. As you, as you go through the Word of God, line upon line, precept upon precept, the Holy Ghost is going to teach you by comparing spiritual things with for spiritual. Amen. Now what does it mean to compare? Comparing means to examine multiple things to understand their relationship by noticing differences and similarities. Amen? You know what the Spirit of God is going to teach you by comparing spiritual things with spiritual? You know what He's actually teaching you? He's teaching you how to rightly divide the Word of God. As you go line upon line, precept upon precept, studying the Word of God, the Holy Ghost is going to compare spiritual things with spiritual, and He's going to teach you how to rightly divide the Word of God, the Word of Truth. Amen? When we, when we talk about comparing things, I'll give you an example. Man and a woman, right? Right? There's a lot of things that are the same, right? they got two eyes. Y'all understand? There's a lot of similarities. But there's major differences between a man and a woman. Just because there's some things that are the same, doesn't mean they are the same. 
There's a lot of things the same about a dog and a cat. They both have fur. They both have eyes. They both have four legs. But they're different. And as you study the Word of God, you have to notice differences in the Word of God. And when things are different, you can't make them the same. Men are men, women are women. Even though they are similar, they are still different. And when you study the Word of God, you have to study it and let the word, let God teach you how to rightly divide the Word of Truth. Amen? You understand? Now we're going to look at some examples. Well, not yet. We're not going to look at examples. I'll get there eventually. Bobby gave me like five hours, right? Five hours. Now look at look at this verse up here. The contrast. He tells Timothy, study to show yourself approved unto God. He says, but shun profane and vain babblings. Amen. So the so the contrast or the difference here is those who study. And those who are just profane and vain babblers. Many preachers in the world are just vain babblers. Amen? Look at what Paul says. They will increase unto more ungodliness. They will increase. That means as time goes on, these profane, vain babblers become more and more and more. They increase. They keep increasing. Amen? That means as time goes on, more and more men claiming to be preachers are nothing more than profane and vain babblers. They haven't been approved of God. They haven't studied to show themselves approved unto God. They are just profane and vain babblers. Look at what Paul says about them. Who concerning the truth have erred. Now does God want all men to come to the knowledge of the truth? Well, if you're listening to men like this, you ain't going to come to the knowledge of the truth. Because men like this have erred concerning the truth. What was their error? They say that the resurrection, you see, that's a Bible truth. The resurrection is true. But they took that truth and they said it's past already. And so they took a Bible truth And made an error concerning that truth. And when they made that error, they overthrow the faith of some. Doesn't mean they quit believing or they quit going to church, but their faith is no longer in the truth, it's in an error. Amen? Somebody can take the rapture, and they just, uh, the rapture is a true Bible doctrine. Yes. But if they take that rapture and they put it out there in the tribulation period, they've now made an error concerning that truth. And so it ain't just about taking Bible truth and taking a verse and say, oh, we believe in the rapture. If you take those Bible truths and you make errors concerning those truths, man's faith is no longer in the truth, it's in a lie. And so it's important, if you're going to teach the Word of God, if you're going to preach the Word of God, it's important that we study to show ourselves approved unto God. Because you can can do great damage to people by mishandling this book. Amen? Here's an example about rightly dividing. But before faith came, We were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterward be revealed. You see that word before and afterward? Amen. 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 Well, then he says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come. So there's a time in the Bible before faith came. And there's a time in the Bible after faith is come. And if you don't get that right, you're going to make major errors in the Bible and destroy people. You know how many, you know how many people get saved today and some religion puts them right back under the law? 
Amen? Because they don't understand that after the faith of Christ came, we didn't need a schoolmaster. Israel didn't need a schoolmaster anymore. The law was like a schoolmaster for little kids until that faith came. So when you read the Bible, there was a time before faith and a time after that faith has come. That's an example of comparing spiritual things with spiritual and understanding how to rightly divide the Word of Truth. Amen? Amen? Now, let's get into some of this. Look, now we're going to look at some of the examples of rightly dividing the Word of Truth. We're going to... i got two verses up here. Now, how many of y'all believe... Matthew 4.23 is the Word of God. Amen. How many of you believe 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4 through 4 is the Word of God? Amen. Then they're both true, right? Amen. Now you know what we're going to do? We're going to set them side by side and we're going to compare them. And if you believe they're both true, let God be true and every man a liar. Let these things be true and every man you've ever heard in your life be a liar. Amen? Amen? My brother already hit it today. Most people tell you there's only one gospel in the Bible. I'm getting ready to show you beyond any shadow of a doubt that that's not possible. Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of what? The kingdom. Amen? Y'all see that? 1 Corinthians 15, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you. Now this is Paul talking. We know what Christ was preaching, the gospel of the kingdom. Well, what was the gospel which Paul preached unto, unto them? For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died. Christ ain't died in Matthew chapter 4. Let God be true and every man up. Okay. How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. None of that has happened in Matthew chapter 4 yet. He hasn't died. He hasn't been buried. He hasn't rose again from the dead. He's preaching to Israel about their kingdom. Amen? Paul is preaching the gospel of how that he died, was buried. What we call the gospel of the grace of God. Amen? So there's clearly more than one. Amen. You say, you know, I, I've had people say, no, Jesus was telling them that He was going to die and be buried and rose again. He doesn't start telling them that until Matthew chapter 16. What comes, let me ask you this. This is going to be a simple question. What's first? 4 or 16? Right? Matthew 16 is three years after Matthew chapter 4. Three years later. And it's at, look, look here at Matthew 16 now. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto His disciples how that He must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. It's not until three years after Matthew chapter 4 that Christ begins to tell His disciples that He's going to be killed and raised again the third day. So how could He be preaching the death, burial, and resurrection there when He doesn't tell nobody about it until Matthew 16? So it can't be the same Gospel. If you believe the Word of God. Amen. Not only that, Peter, poor old Peter, rebuked him. When Christ tells Peter, I've got to die. 
Peter was preaching the gospel of the kingdom in Matthew chapter 10. Amen? Peter's been preaching the kingdom for three years with Christ. And as soon as Christ tells him, I have to be killed and raised again the third day, Peter took him and rebuked him and said, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. You're not going to die. You're not going to be better. You're not going to raise again. Peter knew nothing about this gospel. He rebuked the Lord for even saying it. You see? Now, do you know what that means? Most religious people in this world, they mimic, they have a form of godliness. Remember the, remember, the, remember the two magicians in Egypt when Moses went down there and turned water into blood? And those two magicians went down there and they'd done the same thing. They turned water into blood. Y'all remember that? They mimicked. They copied what Moses did. They were resisting the power of God by imitation, by counterfeit. That's how Satan works today, guys. Satan resists this truth by imitation. There's going to be people in this world that use the word gospel. They're going to use the word baptism. They're going to use all the words that the word of God uses, but they're not using them correctly. Amen? So there's obviously more than one gospel. Look at Revelation 14. There's another one. Right? And I saw another angel fly through the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Now what did Paul say? If we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel than that which we have preached, let him be accursed. Well, there's the gospel Paul preached. Let's see if this angel preaches that same gospel. You ready? You don't have to guess what he preaches because it tells you what he preaches. He preaches, fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment is come. And worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. I didn't see anything about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ anywhere in there. You see, people make it tells you what he preaches. It's and this gospel, now get this now, this gospel will be preached to them that dwell on the earth and to every nation at the hour of God's judgment. You people are not living in the hour of God's judgment. You will be gone before this gospel is preached. If you believe the gospel, if you believe this gospel here, you're going to be raptured before this gospel is preached. Amen? You with me? Okay. Because here's when you're living. The hour of His judgment is come. But here's when you're living. I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation, not the hour of judgment, in the day of salvation have I secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You are not living at the hour of God's judgment. You are living in the day of salvation. You are living in the long suffering of God. Amen? And so what gospel is God preaching during this day of salvation? That Christ died for our sins, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, and all who believe are justified from all things. Amen? Now there's going to come a day when this long suffering and this day of salvation is over. And then they will preach this gospel here. They're going to preach the gospel of the kingdom first, and then they're going to preach this gospel to every nation under, under heaven about the coming wrath of God. Y'all, y'all see? What did we just do? We just compared spiritual things with spiritual. Amen! 
We solve differences. And by doing that, we've learned now a little bit about how to rightly divide the word of truth. Amen? Look here in Matthew chapter 12 here. Y'all having a good time? Look here in Matthew 16, 28. Now this, listen guys, this is going to get deeper and deeper as we go. Each day it's going to get deeper and deeper. Right? But I'm trying, I'm trying to, I'm trying to stay basic. I'm trying to, I want you to understand these things if you don't already. Verily out, now you hear a lot about the kingdom, right? Kingdom, 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 Pentecostals. You know, everybody talking about bringing in the kingdom. Bringing in the kingdom. Most people don't understand the kingdom either. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. You see that? Then He says here, if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. They know what most people think. They see that kingdom there and they think these kingdoms are the same. Right? Let me ask you this. Is the Son of Man and the Spirit of God the same? The Son of Man is flesh and blood. God is a Spirit. Amen? So that must be a physical kingdom, a flesh and blood kingdom. You can see it. Right when it comes, it can be seen coming. That kingdom is coming. This kingdom had already come. Now we're not trying to... Listen, you're, you're sitting there, I don't understand this. You don't have to yet. All we're trying to get you to see is that they're different. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of the Son of Man are not the same kingdom. One is a spiritual kingdom. One is a physical kingdom. One was coming. The other one had already come. You see it? Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Look here. See this kingdom of heaven? How does, a, how does a man get into the kingdom of heaven? Christ said, I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. How does a man get into the kingdom of heaven? He gets into the kingdom of heaven by righteousness. Right? Now what we're going to do, we're going to compare. We're going to compare now and see differences, right? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Are they the same? They're not the same. Do you understand why, now why we say you have to study? Yes. You have to compare spiritual things. You have to compare verse with verse, Scripture with Scripture. And note these differences so that you know how to rightly divide the Word of God. Amen? This, this kingdom here is entered by a spiritual birth. That kingdom there is entered by righteousness. And that's why He tells Israel to seek first what? The kingdom of God. Not the kingdom of heaven. He says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are not the same kingdom. Paul tells you what the kingdom of God is in Romans 14. You and I are in the kingdom of God. We're not in the kingdom of heaven, but we are in the kingdom of God right now. Paul says the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It's not physical. But it's righteousness and peace and joy where? 
in the Holy Ghost. Where is the kingdom of God? It's in the Holy Ghost. And you and I are in the Holy Ghost. By one Spirit have we all been baptized into one body. We have all been born of the Spirit into God's kingdom. And we are now in. Paul said, ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Amen. Amen. Now look at this verse. Here, here's how the Bible is, guys. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough book. It's a very tough book. Because now here I just told you that the, the kingdom of the Son of Man and the kingdom of God were different, right? But now look at what Paul says here. This you know that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Do you know what that means? Both kingdoms are going to become one one day. The spiritual kingdom of God and the physical kingdom of Christ is going to become one kingdom one day. Amen? This is God's will. Christ is now at the right hand of God. And He's now seated at God's right hand. And there's going to come a day when God is going to tell His Son, Go take possession of every throne, every dominion, every power. Jesus Christ is going to possess every kingdom and every power in heaven and in earth one day. And Him and His Father, this kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of God is going to become one kingdom. Amen? I got Psalm 132 up there. Let's read it. The Lord hath sworn in truth unto David. God made David a promise. What was it? Of the fruit of thy body will I sit upon thy throne. What was the promise God made to David? That God is going to sit on David's throne one day. God is going to sit upon David's throne. And the way He's going to sit upon David's throne is through the fruit of David's body. Do you know what David's throne is? David's throne was created to be a joint throne between God and man. Amen? God and the seed of David is going to share a throne in Jerusalem one day. That's what we call the kingdom of Christ and of God. Amen? Revelation 11.15 says... The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. Amen. Do you know who they belong to right now? Satan. Satan took Christ up in a high mountain and showed Him all the kingdoms of the world. And said, all this will I give you. For they are mine, and I give them to whom I will. And if you will worship me, all shall be thine. Satan right now controls the kingdoms of this world. But there's coming a day in which the kingdoms of this world are going to become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. And He shall reign forever and ever. But before that physical can come, there had to be that spiritual kingdom of God. Amen? God, by His Spirit, there has to be that spiritual kingdom first. Christ told Israel, before you worry about the physical, before you worry about what you're going to eat and what you're going to wear, seek first the kingdom of God, the spiritual kingdom of God. And then all the physical things will be added to you. They're not the same kingdom. You understand? You see how we're talking about rightly dividing, right? Here's a good one. And if you can't get this one, then you got some trouble, right? Peter says in Acts 3.21, Whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all His holy prophets, 
since the world began. You see that? Y'all got that one? Now look at this one. Romans 16, 25 through 26. The preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. They can't be the same. Something spoken since the world began and something kept secret since the world began cannot be the same. They're different. And you must study to be able to rightly divide between what was spoken by the prophet since the world began and what was kept secret since the world began. Now do you know who was given the ministry to make known the revelation of that mystery? The Apostle Paul. Paul was given the revelation of this mystery that God had kept secret. And if you want to know the mystery of Christ, Paul, look, look, look at Ephesians real quick, guys. Look at Ephesians chapter 3. How long do I got, Bobby? I don't want to keep everybody too late. <laughs> keep preaching? Y'all okay? Can I keep preaching? I don't have anything to do. I'll stay here. I'll, I'll preach till you fall out the windows, man, like Paul did. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. I can't get you back up though if you fall out. So don't. look at Ephesians three. Look at verse number three. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I what wrote. A four and few words. Whereby when you what? Read. You may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So where's the, where's the mystery of Christ at? It's in writing. How do you understand it? By reading what Paul wrote. That's simple. If you want to know this mystery that had been kept secret since the world began, it was made known by revelation to Paul. He wrote it. And if you will read, you will understand his knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Very simple, right? But you have to rightly divide it from what was spoken since the world began. And we're going to look at this stuff, guys, throughout the rest of the week. I just want you to see right now why you need to rightly divide the Word of Truth. There's things in the Word of God that are different. That's true. Amen? That's true. We're not saying that this one is true and this one isn't or that one's better than this one. We're saying that you must study the Word of God and rightly divide things that are different. It's all true. It's all God's Word. But the only way you're going to understand it is to study it and rightly divide it. Amen? And so we have there prophecy and mystery. And we're going to look at that tomorrow. Is, is understanding the difference between prophecy and mystery. It's the most important division in the Bible. Now here's a difference. Here's another difference. Right? Because look, look at what he says here. Which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and... By the scriptures of the prophets. You see that? So the, the preaching of Jesus Christ. This preaching of Jesus Christ. We preach Christ two ways. Amen? We preach Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. And we preach Christ according to the scriptures of the prophets. Amen? So there's two preachings of Christ in the Bible. One according to the mystery and one according to the scriptures of the prophets. Now when Christ, and guys don't worry, we're going to explain this stuff throughout the week. If you don't understand it now, we're going to explain it. But here's the disciples. Notice what Christ did for the twelve disciples. He opened their understanding that they might understand the what? Scriptures. The twelve apostles... Peter wasn't given this revelation of the mystery. God didn't make the mystery known to Peter. What did He do for Peter and the other, other disciples? He opened their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. Why? 
because they were to preach Christ according to the Scriptures of the prophets. But God made known the mystery to the Apostle Paul. Yes, sir. And you know who He made it known? Why He made it known to Paul? He made it known to Paul for you Gentiles. Yes. Amen? Amen? Paul said, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given to me for you, how that by revelation He made known unto me the mystery. You know who, why God made that revelation known to Paul? He made it known for you Gentiles Amen. that you can know these unsearchable riches of Christ. Because you Gentiles were not a part of inheritance. Israel was the people of inheritance. You Gentiles were outside of Israel's blessings. Remember the Gentile woman that came to Christ and said, Heal my daughter, and he ignored her? And she called out to him again and said, Son of David, have mercy upon me. And he just kept walking. He ignored her. And his disciples said, Send her away. She calleth for thee. And he looked, he looked at his disciples and said, I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then he looked at that woman and said, It's not meat to take children's bread and cast it to the dogs. He, wasn't, he didn't come for us Gentiles. He was only sent to Israel. And that woman said, Truth, Lord. But even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the Master's table. And he said, Great is thy faith, woman. Because she understood what the prophets preached. That the Gentiles were going to be blessed from the overflow of the blessings of Israel. That we were going to be like dogs that get the crumbs that fall from the table. Amen. But Paul made something known much greater than us just getting some crumbs that fall from the table. Paul made known these unsearchable riches to us Gentiles. That we have been quickened raised, exalted, seated in the heavenly places in God's Son to be joint heirs with Him. Amen. You who were sometimes strangers and aliens are now fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Amen. I'm getting ahead of myself. But that, that's what the mystery is about. Look at what Paul says here. This mystery is important. Yes. Paul says, Whereof I am made a minister, if I can get this thing to work, according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you. Even the mystery. What was, given, what was dispensed to Paul? The mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations. That means you couldn't find it in Genesis. You couldn't find it in Exodus. Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Judges. You couldn't find it anywhere in the Word of God. It had been hid from ages and from generations. Amen? And notice what Paul said. That this dispensation which is given to me for you to fulfill what? Meaning without this dispensation given to Paul, the Word of God was incomplete. Because God had kept something hid from ages and from generations, and then He made it known to Paul to fulfill and to complete His Word. Because you couldn't find this mystery in the Old Testament. You couldn't find it in the prophets. You couldn't find it in the Gospels. You can only find it in what was given to Paul. You can only find it in the letters of the Apostle Paul. Amen. Amen. To whom God would make known was the riches of the glory of this mystery among who? The Gentiles. Amen. A few more. Romans 15, 8, Paul says, 
Now this I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. Well, that's not us. We're Gentiles. We were not the circumcision. The circumcision is Israel. Jesus Christ in His earthly ministry was a minister of Israel for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy as it is what? Well, if it was written, then it wasn't kept secret. So this about the what's written about the Gentiles is different than the mystery about the Gentiles. Do you understand? Are you with me so far? Right? And so, yes, the Gentiles were going to glorify God once God saved the nation of Israel. But guess what? Israel's not saved right now. Israel is in blindness. Israel has fallen. Amen. Look here in Romans 11, 11. Things different. Look at the differences here. Now Paul talking about Israel. Give me just a few more minutes guys. I'll shut up. I say then. Have they stumbled. That they should fall. He's talking about Israel. That Israel stumbled that they should fall. God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto who? So salvation come to the Gentiles through Israel's fall. But that's not what was written. What was written is that the Gentiles shall come to thy light and kings to the brightness of thy rising. In prophecy, the Gentiles were going to be saved through the rise of Israel, not through the fall of Israel. You see the difference? Right here, Gentiles are saved through their fall. Right here, Gentiles are saved through their rising. This one is prophecy. This one is mystery. You understand? Yeah. Amen. Now look at what Paul says. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Paul does not want us ignorant of this mystery, lest we be wise in our own conceits. That blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is. So what's he talking about? He's talking about Israel according to the mystery and Israel according to the to prophecy. Israel is not going to be saved right now. Israel is in partial blindness until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. God sent salvation to us Gentiles through the fall of Israel and Israel is in a partial blindness until the fullness of the Gentiles become in and when the fullness of the Gentiles become in all Israel is going to be saved as it is written. Meaning, you did not replace Israel. You are something different. Amen. God, everything God said about Israel, He's still going to do. But what He's doing today is something that He kept hid from the foundation of the world. He didn't make it known. He hid it in Himself. Why? Because Paul said, if the princes of this world had known this mystery, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Amen. Amen. If Satan had known what God was going to do, he wouldn't have crucified Him. Right? We'll close right here, guys. I'll finish some of this tomorrow.
I've got so much material, man, I don't know if I'm going to get through all of it this week or not. Amen? But we'll try our best. Y'all see the, the differences? Well, look, look, look here. Look at Matthew 3, 11. People hear the word baptism. You know what they think? You know what? The first thing that comes to mind when they hear baptism. Water. That's the first thing they think. Water. Water. Why? Did the Bible teach you to think like that or did religion teach you to think like that? Did the Bible teach you to think that every time you hear baptism, think water? Or did some church teach you that? Because Matthew 3, John said, I am indeed baptized you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. There's three different baptisms in Matthew 3.11. There's a water, a Holy Ghost, and a fire baptism. You see it? So how come when we hear baptism do we automatically think about water? Because church has taught us to think like that. Not the Word of God. Now look at Hebrews 6 too. Doctrine of baptisms. There's more than one. But then... Just to make sure that we're all good and confused. Paul said, there's one baptism. You see it? What? There's one baptism? Uh, one, two, three. And then Hebrews talks about more than one baptism. And then Paul said, there's only one baptism. You see what we're doing? We're comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So that we understand how to rightly divide the Word of God and not just running around and talking about baptism and not knowing what we're talking about. We are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. So what, what, how do you explain this? Well, that one baptism Paul's talking about, he quoted it today. Endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That baptism there is obviously a spiritual baptism because it brings about spiritual unity. There is one body. There is one Spirit. Even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. What is the one baptism Paul's talking about? It's 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. The one baptism is not water. It's Spirit. By one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. You say, how do you get that baptism? You get that baptism... The moment you receive the Spirit. You say, how do I get the Spirit? This only what I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. That's why Paul said there's one faith, one baptism. It is one faith that you receive one Spirit and that one Spirit baptizes you into one body in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the baptism Paul's talking about. But it ain't the only baptism in the Bible. But it is the only baptism that gets you into the body of Christ. You can be sprinkled and dunked in water. You can, you can do all that. You can be baptized in water 500 times and that's not going to get you in the body of Christ. The way you get into the body of Christ is to believe the Gospel and receive the Spirit of God and the Spirit of God puts you into the body. Amen? Alright, I'm, I'm going to close my Bible. Look up here, guys. Look up here. Y'all understand the importance of, of rightly dividing. 
Now don't worry, I wasn't trying to explain any of this. I was simply showing you that there's differences in the Bible that we have to study, we have to compare, so that we don't become one of the many that pervert God's Word and corrupt God's Word. Amen? Look here. John the Baptist. Was John the Baptist sent to baptize with water? That's what he said. There's the twelve disciples. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Baptizing them. Were the twelve disciples sent to baptize? There's Paul. Christ sent me not to. Now what's our authority? The Pope or the Bible? Some preacher or this authority of the King James Bible? Amen? There are churches out there that will tell you if you don't get dunked in water, you ain't saved. We got them in America. Paul said, I wasn't sent. John was sent to baptize. These men were sent to baptize. Paul said, Christ sent me not to baptize. Amen. 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 Say, what are you saying, preacher? I didn't say anything. That's the Bible. I didn't write that. I just read it and believed that John was sent. You know why John baptized with water? He baptized with water to manifest Christ to Israel. There was a specific ministry to the nation of Israel. He said, I come baptizing with water that He might be manifest to Israel. These men were sent to baptize, but Paul was not sent to baptize. He was sent to preach the Gospel. Amen? So what, what are we doing today? Are we trying to baptize people or are we preaching the Gospel? Amen? You see, you have to understand these things if you're going to walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. You have to know what God is doing today. You say, you against water baptism, preacher? I didn't say anything like that. What I'm telling you is that Paul's ministry is not the same as this one. Paul's ministry is not the same as this one. Paul does not have the same ministry as the twelve apostles. Because they were sent to baptize, he wasn't. I love you guys. I love you all. You know why I love you all? Because as you've seen that, you were all like, yeah, that's what it says. And you accepted it. In America, they want to fight. They want to tell me that something secret and something spoken is the same. They want to tell me that a man sent to baptize and a man not sent to baptize is the same. Believe the words of God. You cannot learn how to rightly divide the word of truth unless you believe what's written in the word of God. And when you see differences, you have to start studying and figure out why they're different. Amen? Amen. We're, we're going to look at some more of this stuff tomorrow. Amen. I still got... Man, I still got a few more slides to look at, but... Um, I'm going to pray and then I'll let Bobby or... Uh, him. I'm going to pray, brother, and then you can come and close it out. Alright. Let's Amen. pray. Gracious Father, Lord, we thank You for all that You've done for us, God. God, I thank You for my precious Savior, Jesus Christ. I thank You for the blood that was shed on Calvary. I thank You for redemption and the forgiveness of sins. I thank You for this King James Bible, God. I thank You for preserving Your Word for me and giving it to me by inspiration. I thank You, God, for teaching me how to rightly divide it. And I thank You for the open door to come over here to the Philippines 
and to, and, to, and to meet these wonderful brothers and sisters in Christ and to share the Word of God with them, Lord. Father, I pray that you these words that have been spoken here tonight from all the preachers, that they would go inside of our hearts, that they would, they would build us up in Christ, they would edify us, teach us how to, how, to, how to labor with you. And God, I just pray that all the men here would, would be able to understand these things and that they would become skilled workmen and know how to rightly divide your, your, your word, that they may do great, great work here in their own country. And God, we thank you and praise you for all that you do in the blessed and holy and lovely name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Amen.